Welcome to the Avram Davidson universe, where you will get to listen to some of the best short stories ever written. As a youth, Neil Gaiman fell in love with Avram's stories. Philip K. Dick adored him. Ursula Le Guin thought his tales wonderful, and Ray Bradbury compared him to Kipling. Each episode will include a special guest, an amazing short story, and a discussion of that story. Enjoy classic tales such as Or All the Seas with Oysters, The Golem, The Sources of the Nile, and many others. How could you be? It sounds like a story to me, yeah. Sounds like a story to me. Hey, Eileen. Hey, Seth. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm all right. I wanted to start with, I guess, kind of a broad question, which, uh, how do you how do you know Auburn? Well, it's kind of a funny story. I am, um, as a as a you know, as a young teenager, I loved Avram stories and I read them. My mom read them. She read everything I read and, and to kind of keep an eye on me, I think. She never told me not to read things, but um, she, so we, so we discuss Avram stories because they're all real, really involving and mysterious, you know, to a 12 year old. And so we, we were, like, were totally fixated on Avram's work. Wow. And, and I, I'd, you know, when I became a big grown up science fiction writer, I'd see him at a convention, but he was always seemed kind of, you know, a little scary, you know, for such a such a little guy. <laughs> he, he was he was always kind of crotchety, you know. And so I never approached him. I never even went up and said, you know, as I've done sometimes to other writers, not to any great effect, you know, like, well, I loved your work as a kid. And they all are kind of like, hey, I'm not that old. I'm not that old. <laughs> so I never approached Avram. And at, one, it was a Norwest con, I think, a Texas book collector that I know, uh, Billy, Willie Cyrus, who's a, a bookseller um, and, a, and a science fiction collector, came and he came, he was a guest at the convention and he brought a big box of books that he wanted people to sign. And he brought several boxes and there was one box that was all Avram's work. And Avram didn't come to the convention. He wasn't feeling well or something. He just, just didn't make it across the the, the sound and uh so i told willie i'd drive him to bainbridge or to uh bremerton to meet to see Avram, and he knew Avram. and <clears throat> so we drove across and we get to to you know the <clears throat> the tiny house of this great science fiction writer and it was clear you know he he welcomed us in and it was clear he was still a crotchety old man and he what year what year this what year, year was, was this? What, about what? 1990, 91. Okay. M- m- maybe ni- 1990. Okay, so later, so later, later in his life, for sure. Oh, very, yeah, very late in his later, life. Later in his life. Yes, very late in his life. And he was, okay. uh, he, he was what? It was in his late 70s, I think. No, I'm sorry, in his late 60s. He always looked older than than he actually was. And, but he, he invited us in, and he was obviously very happy to see people that he could talk science fiction with and stuff. And we had a lovely conversation. Um, and it, at one point, uh, Willie brought a book that Avram had never admitted having written, the, um, the mystery book. And Willie presented it to Avram to sign. He had long been rumored the author of this book, but Avram looked at it and he kind you of went, and, and took his breath in and he said, I've never signed this. And then he signed the book and I realized how lonely he <laughs> must have been to sign that book. So I, oh my God. I, I offered, he, he was having some trouble with some, some um, manuscripts that were, someone had transferred to digital form and he couldn't read them because it, it it was on a, a DOS computer. He didn't have one. So I said, well, I'll take them and I'll transcribe them. Um, there was one, there were some things that I corrected that were typos, obvious typos. And one of them was THR for T-H-E. And I, I just mm-hmm. noted that too, to, to just to let him know how perspicacious I'd been. And I changed that to T-H-E. And I put an explanation, obvious typo. And, and I get the manuscript back from Avram. So he's, he's marked it up. He's edited it. And he wants me to to print it out again and 
he had sent back, enclosed my letter and he checked off all of the things I'd changed that he'd checked them and they were okay. Till we got to the very last one, THR, obvious typo. And he wrote, not in Vulapuk. <laughs> and I thought, what the hell is Vulapuk? <laughs> and I looked it up and it's an artificial language from the 19th century. That was kind of legendarily weird. <laughs> oh my God. So I, I you know, I, I, how could I resist? <laughs> You know, how could I resist not helping him further? You know, so so we got into a correspondence and I came over and, and saw him a couple times and brought some of his friends over to see him and everything. Jessica Salmonson. And then something really interesting that you brought up, which, you know, I, I, I had this discussion with Ethan last time, which was at, at a young age, I tried to read some of Avram's book at 12 and I, I couldn't get it by myself. So you had your mom who helped you guys read them together, which I think that's, a great way, especially at a young age, to read his work. I mean, how did that start? How did your mom start getting into Avram, and then you got into Avram? How did that happen? Well, I think I started it. I I had been babysitting for people who liked science fiction. I had several different um, families that I babysat for, and and that both of them liked science fiction. They had huge science fiction collections. So when you're babysitting, you actually have a lot of downtime when the kids are asleep or they're fighting amongst themselves or something. And so so I'd, I'd rummage through people's libraries and just read all their books. And in, and then one of the, the um, families, the woman said, um, you know, I can, I can lend you the books. So she gave me a big stack of science fiction books that included um, one of Avram's collections. And uh, and my mom and I read through it. Wow. She she, um, she read everything that that I read. The, she, she sometimes read them first, but the, there was only one book that she told me not to read. And it, she, she didn't tell me not to read it. She said, I think you're going to want to wait a few years before you read this book. And? And she was right. And it wasn't an Auburn book. It was uh, <laughs> Theodore Sturgeon's Some of Your Blood. <laughs> okay. Which, was well, not something for an adolescent girl to read. No, she didn't say no. She just said, "Wait a couple of years." <laughs> now, now your relationship obviously blossomed with Avram, and you know, I had an opportunity to read your short story recently, which was coming to terms, uh, which is obviously there's a lot in it, and I'll be totally honest, I got misty eyed because it made me think of Avram. Uh, I mean. Tell me about that story, how that happened. Well, kind of give me the, yeah, tell me about it. I'm so curious. It's a, and it's, it's beautiful, story, by the way. It's a, it's a story that's in three parts. And I wrote it in three parts. And the fr first part I wrote is it's really about Avram. You know, it's about when, when Avram died, I had been visiting him at the nursing home that he was in and going, you know, every week or two. To, to visit him and bring him things that he liked, like rye bread and bananas and things that he, he things he couldn't get for some reason bananas um, he couldn't get in the nursing home. And I knew the nursing home staff, and some of them knew him. And I mean, they knew knew him as a, as a patient. But there was one woman who was, I think, the um, as she wasn't a, a medical person; she was like a psychological doctor who who. Uh, uh, aide who who like talked to the patients and mm -hmm. she was her first she told me her first visit talking to Avram Avram was very unfriendly he didn't want to be in the nursing home he was really grumpy and everything he was he was acting out and she said to him don't you act that way with me I know who you are <laughs> and he's like no you don't madam you, know, you do not know who I am and she said, I was a student of Joe Haldeman's and Joe Haldeman told me all about you. I've read all your work. And he's like, whoa. And after that, he was a lot nicer to deal with, with everybody in the nursing home. So I, 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 I had been going to see him and he seemed to be getting better. And I, you know, initially I thought, you know, maybe he won't be there when I show up. And it, I brought, I know I brought Jessica once and brought her back, I think. And we went there and I was so used to being there and just walking into his room and not checking in at the gate. So I like, you know, people at the gate were busy. So I just walked by them and he was gone. And I, I was like, I was really glad I had Jessica there with me <clears throat> um, because it, he, he had left 
letters to be, I could tell a few days before he had sent, given me letters to send to Damon Knight and I'm not sure who else. Um, and he, I'd mailed them. So he had, he had letters winging off to people. There was one person with someone he'd had a quarrel with and he was, he wrote them a letter, resolve the quarrel. And he, I was just very, very touched. And the staff was glad that I'd showed up because they had no idea how to get in touch with Ethan. They, had, they didn't have Grania's address or even her name, you know? And so I was able to contact Grania, I think. Okay. Um, I didn't have any way of getting in touch with Ethan. I didn't know Ethan at the time. And so, but I was just kind of heartbroken and I needed to write it down because it was pretty much as I've told you. Speaking of stories, I mean, what's, what's your favorite Auburn, Auburn story? I mean, if you had to pick one, it's, and I know that's a hard, a tough choice, but if you had to pick one, what is it? I think it's such several. Okay. You know that story? Uh-huh, I do. It, it's a, a wonderfully mysterious story to come into for the first time. And then an even more wonderful story to reread. It's a story about a former circus chimp that is intelligent and can talk and is basically being held prisoner in a room with the guy who owns him yeah. and who, who is an, an alcoholic and is drunk most of the time. And the, the chimpanzee crew lives in the world of the circus, which he enjoyed being in. And with these other, it was clear, clearly he was in a freak show as a talking ape or something. And it's just such a, a wonderful disorienting story to find yourself in. And, and then it's, it's just so sad. It's yeah. just a wonderful story. I, 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 it's a brilliant, yeah, it's brilliant and I, I love it. And, and we'll, it'll be, I believe it's in the treasury. Uh, yeah. And so it'll be, it'll definitely be available uh, down the road to listen to, or to obviously to read. So uh, I, I'm looking forward. I haven't listened to it yet. I can't wait. Well, today uh, we're, we're lucky enough to listen to a Edgar Award uh, winner, uh, which is the affair at Lahore Cantonment. And just, I brought a little, a little treat. I don't know. If... <laughs> ah. So that's, that's his actual 1961 Edgar <laughs> Award. So I brought, I brought that Great. along. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, so before, before, we, before we start listening, one thing that I just wanted to ask, and I don't know if you have an answer to this or not, but I was reading one of the forewords where uh, Ray Bradbury compared Auburn to Kipling, uh, among others. And you know, through the story, we'll learn there's, there's a, a Kipling-esque part of it. Why do you think that is? Uh, just, I was just curious if you had any thoughts on that. I think it might be the diversity of, of excellent stories. I mean, uh, both Kipling and, and Avram were extremely prolific and their stories are mean three or four different things at once. And the meaning unfolds as you read it the first time and then the second time and the third time. I see, I see that, I think that's a very acute comparison between Avram and Kipling. And Kipling's stories are marvelous. He's, sort of, I mean, as what happens to older writers is people stop reading them, even if they're world famous. And he, he definitely, his, his thoughts were very, very modern. And I think his stories, um, although, you know, they're set at the end of the 19th century, most of them are, are very modern stories about, about gender issues and, um, uh, the strange lives of people, but people at the end of their ropes, sort of the, the odd lives. And I think that's something that Avram, Avram's gender issues were mostly in his head. I don't think he, his stories particularly touch on gender issues. Um, though I think the affair at the Lahore continent does. It is, the, it is a story that, that relates to gender and race. Um, but um, Kipling was, was much more concerned with those issues, I think, than Avram. Uh, but they both have an interest in the outsider and the, I mean, I think the affair at the Lahore Cantonment is 
a very Kipling-esque story. And of course, it refers to Kipling as well. Um, right. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, I'm going to get it started and we'll listen to it and then we'll talk about it. The Affair at Lahore Cantonment. It is some time before dawn in the late spring as I write this. The seagulls have more than an hour before it will be their moment to fly in from the river, screeing and crying, and then fly back. After them, the pigeons will murmur, and it will be day, perhaps a hot, sticky day. Right now, the air is deliciously cool, but I find myself shivering. I find myself imagining the cold, the bitter cold, of that morning when death came in full panoply, like one dressed for dinner that morning so very long ago. In the winter of 1946-7, to seven, it was cold enough to suit me and more, although the thermometer was well above what I used to consider a cold winter at home. But I was then in England, and the wet and the chill never seemed to leave me. The cottage where I was staying had the most marvelous picturesque fireplaces. It had them in every single room, in fact, but coal was rationed, and firewood seemed not only unavailable, it seemed unheard of. There was an antique electric heater, but it emitted only a dull coppery glow, which died out a few inches away. The only gas fire was naturally enough in the kitchen, a cramped and tiny room, where it was impossible to write. And it was in order to write that I was in England. In the mornings I visited the private library, fortunately unbombed, where lay a mass of material unavailable in America. Afternoons, I did the actual writing. In the early evenings, I listened to the third program while I looked over what I had written and revised it. Late evenings. It was, as I say, cold, raw and damp. I could retire to bed with a brace of hot water bottles and read. I could go to the movies. I could go to the local, see if they had any spirits left, or failing that and it usually failed, have a mug of cider. A beer I don't care for. The local was named... Well, I won't say exactly what it was named. It may have been called the Green Man, or the Grapes, or the Something Arms. A certain measure of reticence is, I think, called for, although by now the last of the principles in the story must surely be dead. But for those who are insatiably curious, there are always the newspaper files to check. But be all that as it may, it was eight o'clock at night. The Marx Brothers were playing at the cinema, but I had seen this one twice before the war and twice during the war. My two hot water bottles gaped pinkly, ready to preserve my feet from frostbite if I cared to retire early to bed. I would have, but it happened that the only reading matter was a large and illustrated work on Etruscan tombs. So the local one, there was really no contest. It was warm there, and noisy and smoky and sociable. True, almost none of the sociability was directed my way, but as long as I wasn't openly being hated, I didn't care. Besides, we were all in luck. There was whiskey on hand. Gin, too. I drank slowly of the stuff that keeps the bare knees of Scotland warm, and watched the people at their quaint native rituals. Darts, football pools, even skittles. A large, rather loutish-looking man at my right, who had made somewhat of a point of ignoring me, said suddenly, Ah, Gaffer's heard there's gin. A sort of ripple ran through the crowded room, and I turned around to look. A man and a woman had come in. A little husk of a shriveled old man, wrapped almost to the tip of his rufous nose. An old woman, evidently his wife, was with him, and she helped undo the cocoon of overcoat, pullover, and muffler that, once removed, seemed to reduce him by half. They were obviously known and liked. Hello, Gaffer, the people greeted him. Hello, Ma. I don't know if I'll be able to come fetch him when it's his going home time, she said. I can manage myself, missus, the old man said querulously. If I don't turn up, some of you give him a hand and see he has all his buttons buttoned. One gin and two ales, Alfred, no more mind. And with a brisk, keen look all around, she was off. She seemed the younger of the two, but it may not have been a matter of years. Thin she was, white-haired and wrinkled, 
but there was no pink or gray softness about her. Her black eyes snapped as she looked around. Her back was straight. There was something not quite local in the accents of her speech, a certain lilting quality. The old man was given a seat at a table near me, and the fellow who had first announced the old man's entrance now said, "'Got your pension today, eh, gaffer? Stand us a drink, there's a good fellow.' The old man stared at a palmful of change, then stirred it with a twisted finger. "'My missus hasn't given me but enough for the gin and the two ales,' he said. "'Ah, oh, Tom's only having his games with you, gaffer,' someone said. "'He does with everyone. Pay no mind.' And they resumed their conversation where they'd left off. The chief topic of the night being that the English wife of an American serviceman stationed in the county had given birth to triplets. "'Ah, those Yanks,' they said indulgently. "'Ah, oh, those Yanks,' Tom mimicked. His spectacles were mended on the bridge with tape. "'They get roaring drunk on the best whiskey that you and me can't find "'and couldn't afford to buy it if we could. "'They smash up cars like they cost nothing. "'You and me couldn't buy them if we saved forever. "'Curse and brawl like proper savages, they do.' There was an embarrassed silence. Someone said, now, Tom, someone looked at me and away quickly, and someone muttered rather weakly about their being good and bad in all nations. I said nothing, telling myself that there was no point in getting into a quarrel with a middle-aged man whose grievances doubtless would be as great if all Americans, civil and military, vanished overnight from the United Kingdom. To my surprise, and to everyone else's, it was the gaffer who spoke up against the charge. You don't know what you're talking about, laddie boy, he said to Tom, who must have been fifty at least. Tisn't that they're Yanks at all. Tis that they're soldiers and in a strange land. That's a wicked life for a man. I've seen it myself. I could tell you a story. Sweet Fanny Adams, no, don't, Tom said loudly, an outburst which did nothing to increase his popularity. I heard them all, millions of times. The old garrison at Lahore, and the Paythans, and the Afghans, and tattered diddles, mountain guns and mules, and oh, the old bloody parade. Give us a rest, gaffer. He could have killed the old man with a slap of his hand, I suppose. The gaffer looked that feeble. But he couldn't shut the old man up now he'd had his sip of gin. No, you don't want to hear naught about it, but I'll tell it anyway. Me? I was fighting for the flag before you was born. For a moment his faded blue eyes seemed puzzled. Oh, but I have seen terrible things, he said in a voice altogether different from his vigorously annoyed tone of a second before. And the most terrible thing of all, to see my friend die before my eyes, and he died hard, and not to be able to do aught to help him. His words died off with a slow quiver. Tom wasn't giving up that easily. What's the football news? he asked at large. No one answered. And not just the fighting in the hills, the gaffer went on. What was that all for? India. They're giving India away now. Now, other things. My best friend. How about a game of darts? Tom urged, gesturing toward the back room through the open door of which we could see the darts board and a frieze of old pictures which dated back six reigns or more. I'd often meant to examine them with attention, but never had. And it's all true, but I've got cuttings to prove it. Young chap from newspaper was there, and saw it and wrote it all up. Oh, it was terrible. Tears welled to the reddened edges of his eyes. But it had to be. Anyone for darts? Someone said, shut up, Tom. Go on, gaffer. And this was many years ago. As you went along the mall in Lahore, which was the local section of the Grand Trunk Road from Calcutta to Peshawar, you passed the museum and the cathedral and the gardens and government house and the Punjab club, and you kept on passing because you were an enlisted man, and the club was for officers and civilians of high rank. And then for three dusty miles, there was nothing to speak of. Natives hardly counted. And then there was the cantonment, and in the cantonment was the garrison. 
Head bloody quarters of the third bloody division of the northern bloody army, said the docker. He spat into the dust. And you can have it all for one bloody yard of the commercial road of a Saturday night, he said. Or any bloody night, for that matter. But his friend, the mouse, knew nothing of the glories of the commercial road. He had taken the Queen's shilling in the market town that all his life he had regarded as if it were London, Baghdad, and Babylon. Lahore? He would have listed to go serve in Kamchatka if it had only got him away from his brute of a father, a drunken farm laborer in a dirty smock. How he often wondered had he got the courage to take the step at all. It frightens me sometimes, Docker, he confessed. It's all so strange and different. The docker gave him a look on which his habitual sneer was half overcome by affection. Don't you have no bloody fear while I'm with you. And he touched him very lightly on the shoulder. The docker was tall and strong, with straight black hair and sallow skin, and a mouth that was quick to anger, and quick to foul words even without anger, and a mind that was quick to take offense, and slow, very slow to forgive. The sergeant major had shouted, I'll teach you to look at me, and had kicked him hard. That night in the lanes on the other side of the little bazaar, past the tank and the place where the Hafiz taught, someone hit Sergeant Major with a piece of iron, thrown with main force, split his scalp open. Who? No one ever knew. When Sergeant Major came off sick list and went around telling about it, spreading his hair with his thick fingers to show the long and ugly wound with its black scab, the darker passed by walking proper slow, and Sergeant Major looked up suddenly, as if he recognized the footfalls, and there was a look passed between them that had murder in it, but nothing was said, nothing at all. And no one kicked the docker after that, and when it became known that he was the pal of the little private everyone called the mouse because of his coloring and his timid ways, why, no one kicked the mouse either after that. See that blackie there, docker? the mouse demanded. See that white bit of string round his waist and over? He's what they call a brahmin, like our parson back home. Only fancy a parson with not more clothes on than that. A mild interest stirred in the big soldier's face. Knew a parson give me sixpence once when I was a nipper, he said. Only I had to come to church and let him christen me like afore he'd leave me have it. Nice old chap. Bit dotty. The crowd was thick on the road, but somehow there was always space where the soldiers walked. They passed a blind Jew from Peshawar, with a grey lambskin cap on his head, playing music on the harmonium. It wasn't like any music the mouse had ever heard, but it stirred him all the same. The docker grandly threw a few pice in the cup, and his little friend admired the gesture. That lane there, the mouse drew close, dropped his voice. They say there's women there. They say some of them won't look at soldiers but they say that some of them will. The docker set his cap a cock on his head. Let's have a look then, Kitty, he said, and see which ones will. But they never did, at least not that day, because they met Lance Corporal Owen going to the bazaar, and with him were three young ladies with ruffles and fancy hats and parasols. They were going to the bazaar to help Lance Corporal Owen buy gifts to send home to his mother and sisters. And this was quite a coincidence, because when the docker heard it, he at once explained that he and the mouse were bound on the same errand. Only they say the best prices are at the places where they don't speak English. And Alfie and me, uh, we don't know none of this Punjabi talk, you see. And because the young ladies, uh, two of whom were named Crucero and Juan de Silva, and they were cousins, said that they knew a few words and would be pleased to help Lance Corporal Owen's friends, and because Owen was very decent about it all, and why not, seeing that he had three of them, they all walked off, three pairs of them. The mouse had the youngest Miss Crucero on his arm, and the docker had Miss De Silva. Perhaps Owen wasn't quite so pleased with this arrangement, but he smiled. But that was how it began, many years ago. Harry Owen was a proper figure of a man, broad shoulders, narrow waist, chestnut-colored hair, eyes as bright blue as could be, always smiling and showing his good white teeth. Not many men had teeth that good. Even the wives of the officers didn't feel themselves too proud to say, Good morning, Owen. 
It was as if there was a sun inside of him, shining all the time. The three of them became friends, the six of them, the Docker and Leia the Silva, Harry and Margaret Crucero, and the Mouse and Lucy Crucero. To be sure, Lucy was rather dim and didn't say much, but that suited her escort well enough. He had little to say to her, but he would have felt all sorts of things bubbling up inside of him if he had been walking with Miss De Silva. But that he knew was impossible. Miss De Silva was so clever, so handsome, so self-assured. He would have been tongue-tied beside her. Besides, she walked with the docker, and so, for all that she was pleasant to the mouse, he was too shy to do much more than nod. Later on, he was to think that if the docker had known that Leia de Silva was not really English, and that she and her cousins and all the others of their class were not regarded by the soldiery as, well... But he did not know. Chasteness was not a highly prized attribute in Cat's Meat Court, where the docker's wild, slum Arab childhood had been largely spent. Indeed, it was a quality almost completely unknown. He had no experience of respectable girls, neither half-caste, nor quarter-caste, nor Simon Pure English. The daughters of the officers lived in a world sealed off from him, and the few daughters of NCOs almost as much so. To men like Lance Corporal Owen, Eurasian girls may have seemed to lack that certain quality which spelled rude hands off, which the English girls at home had had. But the docker knew nothing of afternoon teas and tiny sandwiches, of strict papas and watchful mamas, of prim and chaperoned walks in country towns. For him, the Victorian age had never existed, raised as he had been in a world little changed from the fierce and savage 18th century. But this did not bring him to take liberties now. On the contrary, to the docker, a railroad telegrapher, for such was Mr. De Silva, burly and black-mustached, was a member of a learned profession. He little noticed that the ever-blooming Mrs. De Silva wore no corsets and let her younger children run about the house naked, and little cared. He knew that there were girls to be had for a thruppenny bit, and there were girls who were not. All the latter were respectable. No cottage in Kensington could have been more respectable in the docker's eyes than the old house where the De Silvas lived three or four generations of them, in dark and not always orderly rooms, smelling of incense and odd sorts of cooking. That the girls were not exactly bleached white in complexion was nothing to him. The docker was dark himself. When Mr. and Mrs. De Silva boasted of their ancestry, of Portuguese generals and high-ranking officials of the old East India Company, the docker felt no desire to doubt. He felt humble. Miss Leia de Silva was quiet and ladylike enough when talking to the docker, but she could be fierce and sudden when someone in her family did anything she thought not right. Perhaps her parents had been something less than keen as mustard about the docker. He was only a corporal. Did they feel that their daughter should look higher? A sentence like a shower of swords from Leia in a language which had once been Portuguese silenced them. One afternoon, when the barracks were almost deserted, the docker summoned Owen and the mouse to consult with. He produced a bottle and offered it. And risk my stripe? Well, thanks, my boy, but no thanks, said Owen. The mouse took a small sip. The docker's manner was very odd, he thought. He was proud and he was abashed. He was happy and he was uneasy. Here's the thing, he said. I mean to marry Miss De Silva and he gave them a challenging look. Good, said the mouse. I know she'll have me, the docker went on. But, well, there's Susanna. Oh, ah, agreed Owen. There's Susanna. Susanna was a girl who had a little house of her own, often visited by soldiers, one of whom had been the docker. Her mother was a woman of some tribe so very deep in the hills that they were neither Hindu nor Muslim. Heaven only knew how she had come to Lahore, or where she had gone after leaving it, for leave it she did after her baby was born. And heaven presumably knew who the father had been. Susanna had been raised and educated by the Scottish Mission and had once been employed in the tracts department of its printing establishment. 
The officials of the mission had been willing to forgive Susanna once, then twice. They had even been willing to forgive Susanna a third time, but not to retain her in the printing establishment. Whereupon Susanna had renounced the Church of Scotland and all its works, and had gone altogether to the bad. I'm going to break off with her, said the doctor determinedly. I shan't give her no present, neither. No money, I mean. I know it's a custom, but if I'm going to be married, I shall need all the money I've got. That's rather hard on Susanna, said Owen. Can't be helped, said the doctor briefly. Now I'm going to write her a letter. He wanted assistance, but he also was strong for his own style. The letter in its third and least smudged version was brief. Dear friend, it's been a great lark, but now it's all over, for I am getting married to someone else. Best not to see each other again. Keep merry and bright, respectfully. That'll do it, the doctor said with satisfaction. Here's two Annas. Give them to a bearer, one of you, and send the letter off directly. I'm going to start tidying up myself and make it, as I mean to speak to Mr. De Silva tonight. But he never spoke to Mr. De Silva that night. Sergeant Major came striding in, biggest catch in Junga, and swollen with violent satisfaction, and found the bottle in with the docker's gear. The docker drew three weeks, and was lucky not to lose his stripes. There was a note waiting for him when he came out. Dear docker, I hope you will take it in good part, but Miss De Silva and I are going to be married Sunday next. Perhaps it was not quite the thing for me to do, to speak during your absence. But love knows no laws, as the poet says, and we do both hope you will be our friend. Sincerely, Harry Owen. For a long time, the doctor just sat and stared. Then he said to the mouse, Well, if it must be, I should have known a girl of her quality wouldn't ever marry a brute like me. Ah, but docker, the mouse said. Then in a rush of words, It isn't that at all. Don't you see what it was? The note you meant for Susanna, Owen sent it off to Mr. Silver instead, and then went and proposed himself, and it must have been him who peached that you had the bottle. The doctor's face went dark, but his voice kept soft. Oh, he said, that was how it was, and said nothing more. That night he got drunk wildly, savagely drunk, wrecked twenty stalls in the little bazaar, half killed two Sikhs who tried to stop him, and coming into the sleeping barracks as silently as the dust, took and loaded his rifle and shot Harry Owen through the head. Yarn, 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 said Tom. I don't believe you was ever in India in your life. The gaffer, who had been sipping his beer silently, fired up. Oh, don't you? One of you fetched that pitcher, the one directly under the old king's. He gestured toward the rear room. In a very short time, someone was back and handed over an old cardboard-backed photograph. It was badly faded, but it showed plainly enough three soldiers posed in front of a painted backdrop. They wore ornate and tight-fitting uniforms and had funny, jaunty little caps perched to one side of their heads. That ends me, said the gaffer, pointing his twisted old finger. The faces all looked alike, but the one in the middle was that of the shortest. When it was passed to me, I turned it over. The back was ornately printed with the studio's name, and sure enough, it was in Lahore. A fact I pointed out, not directly to Tom, but in his general direction. And in one corner, somehow bare of curlicues, was written in faded ink, a date in the late eighties and three names, Lance Corporal Harry Owen, Corporal Daniel DeVore, Private Alfred Graham. Young chap from newspaper was talking about it to the Padre Saeed, the gaffer was saying. Ernest young fellow, had spectacles, young as he was. But a thing like that, sir, says he, so unlike a British soldier, what could have made him do a thing like that? And the chaplain looks at him and sighs and says, Single men in barracks don't turn into plaster saints. The writing waller thought this over a bit, then, No, he says, I suppose not, and wrote it down in his notebook. Well, Tom said grudgingly, so you've been to India, but that doesn't prove the rest of the story. It's true, I tell you. 
I've got cuttings to prove it. Civil and Military Gazette of Lahore. Tom began singing. Oh, this happened in Derby, I never was known to lie. And if you'd have been there in Derby, you'd have seen it the same as I. Someone laughed. Tears started in the old man's weak blue eyes and threatened to overflow the reddened rims. I've got cuttons. Tom said, yes, you've always got cuttons, but nobody does see them but you. You come home with me, the gaffer said, pushing his knobby old hands against the tabletop and making to rise. You come home with me. The cuttons are on my old trunk, and you ask my missus, for she keeps the keys. You just ask my missus. What? cried Tom. Me ask your missus for anything? Why, I'd soon as ask a lion or a tiger or whip snade zoo for a bit of their meat as ask your missus for anything. She's a tartar, she is. The gaffer's mind had evidently dropped the burden of the conversation. He began to nod and smile, as if Tom had paid him a very acceptable compliment. But he seemed to recall the object of Tom's remarks rather than their tone. Oh, she was a lovely creature, he said softly. Most beautiful girl you ever saw. And it was me that she married after all, you see. Not either of them two others, but me, that they called the mouse. And he chuckled. It was not a nice chuckle. And as I looked up sharply, I caught his eye, and there was something sly and very ugly in it. I went cold. In one second I was all but certain of two things. Gaffer, I said trying to sound casual. What was your wife's maiden name? The gaffer seemed deep in thought, but he answered as casually as I'd asked. Her name? Her name was Leia da Silva. Part British, part Portuguese, and part... But who cares about that? Not I. I married her in church, I did. And how, I asked, do you pronounce D-E-V-O-R-E? The dim eyes wavered. Worked in the West India docks, was why we called him the docker, said the old man. But his Christian name, it was Daniel Diva. Yes, I said, of course it was. And it wasn't Harry Owen who peached about the whiskey bottle in Daniel's gear so as to get him in the guardhouse. And it wasn't Harry Owen who sent the note to the wrong young lady, was it? It was someone who knew what Harry would do if he had the chance someone who knew that the docker would certainly kill Harry if told the right set of lies. And he did, didn't he? And then the way was all clear and open for you, wasn't it? For just a second there was fear in Gaffer Graham's face, and there was defiance too, and triumph. Then swiftly all were gone, and only the muddled memories of old age were left. It was cold, he whimpered. It was bitter cold when they hanged Danny Deaver in the morning. There was that young chap from the newspaper that wrote about it. Funny name he had. Something like Kipling. Ruddy Kipling, t'was. Yes, I said. Something like that. So what'd you think? Oh, it's a fantastic story, and that's a wonderful reading. And that's just yes, a lovely uh, reading that story. Stefan Rudnicki is, is amazing. Um, I feel really lucky that, uh, that he has been doing some of these. So it's been pretty incredible. Uh, any, you know, any interpretations right off that you want to want to throw out there? Any thoughts on this? Uh, well, you know, I've thought about that story a lot and it's a, it's a story that has many layers and sort of nested stories. So that there, there's the, 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 Beginning where where the where the writer who is obviously Avram I think is is in Britain after the war and he's cold and grumpy and <laughs> Avram Avram was there he was there in I think 1950 and in, in the winter and had no money and you know so so he, he's put himself right at the beginning of that story and which gives him the right to comment on it at the end you know that's I think that's a, that device of him starting off with with the writer and ending with the writer is is a, is a hard one to pull off successfully, but he re really does it. 
and then then the story of of the guy he sees in the bar the story that that man tells about yeah. being in india uh in probably around the turn of the 20th century yeah um, 1880s i'm guessing right yeah and 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 then that, that's a perfectly told story and it's about the betrayal of a large kind of brutal guy by a smaller guy he protected. And Avram has told that story several different times. He told it in um, the, uh, are all the seas with oysters. Yeah. Uh, and he told it in a novel that he wrote, a, a, an uncom unfinished novel. He wrote in, I think 1947 after the war called the Corsman. Mm. And that, that's um, set in a, a marine boot camp that he was at. Uh, he was a um, conscientious objector during the war and was trained to, in, in a, the Navy and the Marines had a common boot camp and he was trained in, at that boot camp in Florida. And he, he witnessed a lot of, of racial uh, separation there, a lot of sort of apartheid within the camp. And he commented on that. I, he, he objected to that very strongly. Hmm. So, and he would, I believe the other Marines did as well to being kept apart with the black Marines being seated elsewhere in, they were, they were seated in the balcony or something at events. And the Marines fought back against that and, and protested it. And the rules I believe were changed. Wow. So, um, but anyway, he, he, so, so race, racial issues were not foreign to him. And he was, he, he all his life, I believe, um, he, he pushed back against that. Wow. Acknowledged it. He saw it and he saw it in, his, in some of his writing. So the story is also, I think, about race and lack of privileges. Um, the, the characters in the story, all of the characters in the story are people without privilege or presence in, in the larger economic part of the world. And the, the female character, the woman uh, that you meet at the beginning as an old lady, and then you see her younger is um, also a, she's, I think she's Filipina, but it's, she has Portuguese names. So uh, it's really unclear what her, her ethnic background is, but she's, she's definitely, she and her sister and cousin are, are I have the all, they're all, um, I think slightly darker skinned and, and, and the, there is an issue made of how it's, their names are, are Filipino. So, oh, I, I had the impression, I had the impression that she was a Portuguese and Indian. I think that's true, but that's, that doesn't, that was, come that, was, that I, doesn't, that, that isn't explicit. Right. What's explicit is that they have Portuguese names and the Portuguese, you know, yeah. were also dis, uh, discriminated against and considered darker skinned people. And um, it, especially like in, in the Anglo countries, in India, yeah. in, in Anglo India and in, um, in, in England. So it's, but, the, but that's, that's, I think, relatively subtle. And it's not something that the, the writer notices when the man and woman come into the bar as a little old white haired old lady, she's not described as being any different than any other little white haired old English lady. And I, I thought that was a specific point that Avram was making about from being in England and from being in England. Um, when I was, you know, when I was much younger, like my first visit to England and when I was in my early twenties, um, seeing, seeing all of these people from all over the globe who are obviously English sp speaking in English accents. And, you know, they, this was, this was not their first language to us, to me, a, a kind of a wonderful surprise, you know, it's like, wow, 
of course, I should have anticipated this. I should have seen this, but I didn't. And so I think it's some kind of a comment on, on that because this is about the writer's first impressions of being in England in 1950. So I think his attention to detail like that, that is not called out, it's, uh, it's subtle, it's very subtle. And, you know, and I've probably read this story 15 or 20 times. It's something that eventually you think, no, wait a minute, he's, what's going on here in this little aspect of detail? And that's aside from the plot of the story. No. The story actually has several plots, but and then the reference to Danny Deaver, um, which is a, a the hanging of Danny Deaver, I think it's called, it is a poem by Kipling. Yep. And it's very yep. when I was younger, it was a very well very well read poem. Not that kids necessarily knew it, but they had to they had to read it, and it was it was a common <laughs> poem you had to read by Kipling in English class. Um, wow. So, so that poem would be familiar, and he sort of assumes that that poem is familiar to the reader. Right. There, there were there were a couple couple things that I that struck me. One, he talked about obviously the big point about soldiers. You know that these this isn't the way when he talks about Americans, how bad Americans are at the bar, and then he's like, no, it's not about Americans, it's about soldiers. But then I kind of I thought about that, and then I thought, but. Yeah, but but then Alfred or the mouse is also kind of evil. And would it have mattered if he's a soldier or not? And so then I, I kind of went back and forth and he, I didn't know what to think. Well, that's great. I hadn't noticed that. I Yeah, that's a, that's a kind of wonderful. And of course, he wouldn't decide for you. You have to decide for yourself. That's one of the things about Avram's story is this, that he lays out these things, but he doesn't decide everything for the reader. Right. Well, if you, you know, I, I always like to uh, just, I always like to say who, who would play these parts if we turned this into a movie and, and something about, about this story in, in general, which I find really interesting. Some of his stories, I mean, it's a short story and yet it feels like an epic. I mean, mm -hmm. this is short. Other stories of his, they're not necessarily, they don't feel like epics, but this feels big. And, and, and anyway, so, so if you had to choose the the characters and who would play them. I, I I love this game. Any thoughts on on who would play the different characters? So I I I decided to cast it with with actors that would have been available at the time, sort okay. of in in Avram's head, kind of actors and actresses. So I would have Clark Gable play, play the the large soldier that that falls in love with the woman and the, the docker. Yeah. Okay. And I, I didn't write down their names, so I, I'm 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 always missing names. Oh, no problem. I'll get it. And then I, I think for the smaller, weaker guy, I would cast Humphrey Bogart, which I think is <laughs> against type. But I've seen Bogart play. Um, it's early, very early in his career. Play play small, um, unpleasant little characters, and I think he could do it. And he was a much smaller guy than Humphrey Bogart. I mean, than than Clark Gable. Clark, Clark Gable was six foot one and Humphrey mm -hmm. Bogart was five foot eight. So they could, I mean, in the movies, they would, you know, they, they manipulate things to make all the char men, male characters look like big guys, but this movie, they wouldn't have to manipulate to make Clark Gable a big guy and Humphrey Bogart a smaller guy. I think Bogart could handle it. And then for the, for the woman, I, 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 I actually looked around for names of Indian actresses that might be recognizable to an American audience um, now, and I couldn't, I couldn't pull one out. Um, so I cast Dorothy Dandridge in that role. I think she would be great. Okay. I don't know if you know who Dorothy Fantastic. Dandridge is because she is she is a black actress who is very uh, wonderful actress. Like she is fairly light skinned black woman. So okay. I think could could pass as as the character in the story, basically. Great. Well, and, well I, and she was a great actor. <laughs> uh, I I decided so my feeling is for Avram, because who would play Avram? Uh, <laughs> I thought. And and I am telling you, I this is a, a at least an Academy Award nominee, if not an Academy Award. I mean I'm giving this to this person. 
But uh, he's, a, he's a comic actor. I don't know if you know who he is. Uh, Seth Rogen. Oh, yeah. He's, uh, yeah. So, so he's in this new American Pickle, which I'll, I'll send the picture. I mean, he is, he is Avram. And, and I'm going to give him a twofer, which is, I don't know how many of my, of my mom's books you read, but he loves his grass with Snoop Dogg. So Dr. Grass. So he could go Dr. Grass. He could do his, get his Academy Award for a serious role. Uh, in in this, so so he could play Abram. I also thought if he wasn't interested, maybe John Stewart. I don't know if you've seen these grown grown things he's grown out his beard, but possibly John Stewart. Uh, <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> for for the mouse, I was thinking uh, Daniel Radcliffe from Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Small, thin, English, uh, and then I've really been enjoying the. Uh, what is it called? The um, The Boys. I don't know if you've watched The Boys. It's a prime okay. show. So uh, Billy Billy Butcher. He the, it's Carl Urban who plays uh, Billy Butcher. Uh, he's also Doctor McCoy in the new Star Trek movies. So he's a New Zealand actor, dark skin, big, six one, muscular. So he'd be great. And then uh, for Lance Corporal Harry Owen, uh, another another home uh, another actor from the boys which is anthony Starr, who plays homelander really white teeth blue eyes uh and then for Leia da silva i also had to look up and i found this perfect actress or actor uh Wal walusha da souza who's portuguese german and indian wow so perfect and then i was thinking we got to have someone play uh, uh kipling so I thought either uh, Killian Murphy, who is from Peaky Blinders, I don't know if you've ever seen that, uh, or Stephen Colbert. <laughs> a, little, a little cameo of, of, of Stephen Colbert <laughs> playing Kipling. So, so that's what I had for you. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And that's doable now. Yeah. So, so that, that one, I mean, of all this, you know, as I, as it really is, that one is movie, like I think about different ones. That could really be an amazing, I would, gosh, would I love to see that in, in a movie. Uh, so updates just coming up for us, uh, just for, for people to know, Moonbird, uh, one of my mom's books is done, uh, but it's, it, it hasn't been put out yet, but it's, the reading is done. Uh, Rainbow Annals is almost done. Boss in the Wall is done and is available. Uh, Dr. Grass is done and available. The Treasury should be ready in late November. And the other 19th century is almost done. So those are those are the updates for wow. audio. You've been busy. <laughs> I have to be careful. This doesn't take over my day job, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and it's sort of been my COVID experience uh, to, to do this. And, and it's really meant a lot. So I can't thank you enough for, for, for joining me. And anything else you want to add or... Let me know. Uh, thank you for for inviting me to think about all this again because this yeah. is you know just so much. I could just go through the tre I mean I've got the treasury here. I could just keep reading story after story in there and and I've read most of them. I you know I, I've read almost all of Avram's work I think, um, but they're just they're just like bonbons. You just want to go yeah. from one to another to another. And, and you can go back and read them so many times, which is, it's unbelievable. I'm, I'm still working my way through all these materials, uh, which it's just been, you know, I feel like I have four or five years worth of material to read. So it's fantastic. So Eileen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let's be in touch. Okay. Thank you, Seth. Yeah. Talk to you later. Bye.